If you're on mute, then I can chant. Other, yes. Otherwise, if you chant back, it doesn't work. Yeah, okay. We'll do a little kirtan. <laughs> Okay. Are there other devotees listening at home on Skype? I mean, on uh, Zoom? Yeah, we have a, right now we have another five, six participants. I think the rest of the Berlin congregation will join now in a few moments. Okay. <laughs> One second. I bought this keyboard in 19, probably 99. And it's been sitting around while I travel. So now that I'm back, I have my one man band here. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. 
I just changed the setting on the keyboard and it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Anyway, that's what happened. Hare Krishna. Maybe that's Krishna's arrangement. Okay, one more verse. Everyone together. Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Okay, one more time. Hare Krishna. Shnubaraya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachalini Nivisyasa Sanivari Pachalini So, first thing I want to do is tell you what we had discussed with Malani about what we should talk about. And so when anyone asks me, what do you want to talk about? I ask, what do you want to talk about? What, what did the devotees want to hear? Because I can talk about so many things, but I'm more interested in knowing what the devotees want to talk about. So the title of today's class is how to nourish it so we can let go. So I have to explain this title to you and how it evolved, because it evolved. So this is what we hit. I said, what do you want to talk about? And Malini had spoken to several devotees. And this is what she said. These are all the things she said. How to remain faithful in times of uncertainty. In other words, how to be things are Maybe your life is falling apart or the life of other people is falling apart. And, you know, it tests our faith. So how do you remain faithful when things are not going the way they should? You can hear okay? Yes? Okay. Yeah, good? Okay. My, um, my father's parents are from Austria. 
but at that time he said Austria didn't exist. So maybe they're from Germany. Maybe we're all brothers and sisters. I have, my last name is German, so, or Austrian, anyway. Same thing, right? Okay. Then we had discussed how to remain Krishna conscious when the world is pandemic consciousness. One God sister said that things are so bad, the new mantra is always remember coronavirus and never forget coronavirus because everybody's talking about coronavirus, right? It's like, you know, the... Um, the mantra, the shloka, always remember Krishna, never forget him. You know that? You've heard that? You've seen the t-shirt? This side it says, always remember Krishna. On the back it says, never forget Krishna. Have you seen that? Nice t-shirt, always remember Krishna, never forget him. So now it's always remember Corona, never forget him. That's become the obsession. So that was, um, that was the next point. How to remain Krishna conscious when the world is pandemic conscious. How to nourish faith, uh, life. These are the things that we were discussing. She was throwing out. Life is uncertain. How to let go of the illusion that we're in control. And how to remain faithful in the Lord and his plans in times of great uncertainty and the influence of media and conspiracy theories. So from that, we came up with this title, How to Nourish Our Faith So We Can Let Go. But it, it incorporates all of this. And of course, to actually really get into this, we need at least 10 hours. So I will do my best in one hour. We have one hour, is that right? Or less than an hour? How much, one hour? One, okay. That includes questions. And if I speak too fast, you won't understand me. <laughs> okay, so today we're gonna to do something, I don't know, this may be, I, what I did was this morning, I looked at these things that we had discussed as topics, and then I just started writing. And I want to read and discuss what came out. And it's not necessarily systematic. So it could, one thought could get broken by another thought to return to the first thought. So you bear with me, but this was my, what we call in English, stream of consciousness. Have you heard that word before? Stream of consciousness. You just, what do you think? And you just, you just go, right? So this is my stream of consciousness. And then I want to discuss it with you because I wanted at least to have some, some structure. I don't know, I guess Germans are more structured than Americans, I don't know. But it does have some structure. It just, it was, you know, it was just me writing. You know, this is the first draft be before editing. And this may end up being an article, okay. Before I start, I want to I want to mention also that one devotee who is uh, he's giving me some guidance about what is relevant today, what's going on in the world, and he said one of the biggest topics on people's minds is coping with loss because there's more loss now, loss of money, loss of jobs, loss of friends, loved ones. So it's a big issue on people's minds and probably on a lot of the minds of devotees. Okay. So my first thought on letting go, I, I started this top thought on letting go. How do you let go? Um, how to nourish our faith so we can let go. <laughs> letting go will also nourish faith. But my first thought on letting go, which is a reoccurring thought, is a lot of what we have to let go of, we never owned. And so it's an illusion that we're letting go of it. It's like, how can you let go of something that was never yours? And sometimes we identify something as ours, and it's not actually ours, isn't it? And so probably the biggest illusion of what is ours is the body, right? And the most difficult thing to let go probably is going to be the body, you know, like... I crashed my car, okay, let go of it. Somebody stole my computer, okay. Yeah. I can get over that. 
I can get a new one. I can get a new car. So, so for a while, I'm in anxiety. Oh, my car, my computer. You know, well, it's not actually mine. Nothing belongs to me. I'm not really letting go of it because I don't own it. But the body, there's a sense that we own the body. And so that's the most difficult thing to get up, to give up, obviously. But the body, the, the, you know, think about this thought. There's so many things we have to let go that we just think we have to let go of, but how can you let go of it if you never owned it? And letting go of the body, because it's the biggest thing, is what we're learning to do. We're learning to prepare for death. And all these other things that we have to let go of are just preparations for letting go of the big thing. And if you can't let go of the little thing, how are you going to let go of the big thing? It's going to be very difficult. And what we see is that when we evolve our consciousness and stop thinking all these things are mine to control, control is another issue, but we'll get to that. But just that it's mine, if it's mine, I have a right to control it. So many of these things are not mine. And as we practice letting go of what, what isn't mine, then the big let go, the ultimate let go of the physical body, it's not going to be as difficult as we may think. And we have seen with devotees and people who are more spiritually evolved, for them dying is, it's not, it's not such a big ordeal. They're so used to letting go of what is not theirs. They're so used to letting happen what happens. They're so used to letting go of things they can't control that that ultimate the ultimate experience is letting go of the physical body. They, they can actually do that without anxiety. So I just wanted to um, kind of keep that in mind. I've been giving a class on, we've been giving a class every morning, so it would be 2 p.m. your time for the last two months on death. And it's been, it's been very enlightening. And one of the things we realized that in order to prepare to die in Krishna consciousness, you have to kill your false ego first. Because once the false ego is dead, the false ego thinks that I'm the body, that I own this. Once that is dead, then you realize you don't actually die. So that's an interesting concept. Nothing is dying. It's only the concept that something's dying. Like, I think I'm the body. I think I'm dying. I think I'm not the body. I'm not dying. Now... Maybe, um, yes. Um, okay, now, very, I just mentioned false ego, so I want to talk about it because it's very, very interesting. We've all heard the word false ego, right? What does false ego mean? Well, technically, ego means identity, and false means false identity. And we were talking about the body being a false identity and talking about killing the false ego. So what does it mean to kill the false ego? Well, how does the false ego work? When one is in conscious, uh, material consciousness or consciousness that I'm a physical being, then when one perceives the world, they look at things in relation to themselves and even things not always in relation to themselves, but things that they would like to have as theirs. This is mine. It's like, it's like imagine you carry a stamp. And everywhere you go around, you stamp, this is mine, All right? This is my wife, this is my husband, my home, my car, my, my body. My, and then you go into the shop and you're thinking, you're thinking potentially, you bring your stamp into the store, right? You go, this could be mine, <laughs> this could be mine. And you buy it, you take it home and you it's mine. So, so you can understand where this loss is coming from, because we're always stamping mine, mine, mine. So when we lose something, we just lost ours, right? This is my wife. This is my husband. Well, not exactly yours. Maybe, maybe kind of in your possession, sort of, but you don't really control your husband or wife. You wish you did, but you don't, right? Any woman who's tried to control her husband, any husband who's tried to control his wife, eventually learns that's a bad idea. 
for some it takes like a few lifetimes to learn some they learn fast some you know it takes a few decades but eventually you'll learn you can't control people so false ego says it's mine if it's mine i can control it so you think about you think about this think about how material consciousness works everything in that store if i have enough money or if i have enough credit cards is potentially mine i will own it we have a nice house here and somebody came it's out in the country and someone says oh you you have a nice place and i say no i don't you say you 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 they said something like you own a nice place I said, no i don't the bank owns it so you know what do you actually own really what are you going to take with you so now but we have to contrast that with spiritual consciousness spiritual consciousness has a stamp also what's the stamp it's krishna's so now you can stamp your head Boop, you can get a tattoo right here it says, this body belongs to krishna or maybe you don't want to put it on your forehead you can put it somewhere else <laughs> you decide where you want to put it or maybe you just want to do mendy so you know maybe maybe you can test it out with mendy first this body belongs to krishna's or maybe it's just krishna's property yeah so when you're in, when you're not in false ego when you're in real ego consciousness then everything you look at has this stamp krishna's property doesn't it oh i just bought a new house krishna's house i just bought a new car krishna's car i have a keyboard it's krishna's keyboard what do i do with krishna's keyboard i don't sing baby i love you with krishna's keyboard right i say krishna i want to love you uh, that's the difference so when i see it as krishna's keyboard it gets used for krishna when i see it as mine it's like okay let's do whatever we want you know isn't it that's the that's the idea so everywhere devotee looks he sees everything belongs to krishna everywhere non-devotee or or while we're evolving into devotees we see everything is mine so that was my first point if you see everything not as yours then how could you lose something because it was never yours it was always krishna's does that make sense and I, and I think i think the most important thing is what we were talking in this class on death is that everything is about everything is about practicing like and this is such an important practice because ultimately everything is going to be taken away right at some point and this is the practice if you never identified with it or you evolve so you don't identify with with these things then when it's taken away it's like oh you know it's like somebody taking away you know something from the house next door it doesn't affect you because it's not yours right so then you might say but prabhu what about anxiety what about worry what about stress i I'm, I'm feeling that that's mine yes but i think a lot of us have created a stress factory in our brains so we're we're manufacturing stress i mean stress is not something that exists as a substance you you can't go to a store and buy stress i mean you know it, it, we could say you, you buy something and you, you know you don't know how to use it and you just bought stress you buy a big house you bought stress but in in the sense of as as a substance stress is created in response to a situation so we are creating the stress and, and so we may say stress is real but two people can be in the same situation and one person's stressed by it and one person isn't so we're actually creating stress and if we created it it means we can decreate it it's not decreated discreated does that make sense so how do i let go of stress the same way you created it why don't you discreate it you know what were the circumstances that created it you can discreate it by discreating the way you think about it by thinking about it in a different way so stress is usually the result of thinking about something in the wrong way thinking about myself as a controller right okay so that's the wrong way to think i'm not the control i'm not um okay 
You want to do an interesting exercise? Well, maybe you'll have to do this for homework, but I'll explain it because I've done this before and it's very interesting. You, you take a piece of paper, make a vertical line down the center, and on the left side you write what I control, on the right side you write what I don't control. And then you write down everything you control on the left side and everything you control on the right side. And this is such an interesting exercise because when you start to look at the left side and question, do I actually control these things that I said I control, you'll see there's a lot of things you actually don't control. You just think you do. And on the right side, there are a lot of things you're not controlling that you should control, like your mind, your senses, your anger, your emotions. Uh, I can't control this, you know. So you start to see you've got sides mixed up a little bit. There's a lot we think we can, can, can control, but when we think about it, we actually don't. Isn't that interesting? And there's a lot we can control internally that we don't. We say, I could never do that. No, but we could, but we don't. So it's always good to reassess what I can control and what I can't control. And I think, I think one of the best examples I'm just, I don't, I'm not reading from this because I just wrote it, so I remember it. And half of what I wrote, I already taught a million times. So we're just kind of, maybe it's more systematic if I go like this. So one of the things that, that is so amazing about trying to control what we can't control is events of the past. Think about that. Have you ever dwelled on an event of the past and thinking, why did that have to happen? Or I wish I hadn't done that. I wish he hadn't done that. I wish she hadn't done that. I wish that the prime minister hadn't done that. I wish the government hadn't done that. I wish my temple president hadn't done that. No, you never think like that, but only the prime minister, yeah. So have you ever thought, why did that have to happen? What if that didn't happen? Okay. We've all thought like that, right? Some, something in the past. Why did I have to be in that situation? Why couldn't, why, why did I say that? It's caused so much problem, right? So as you know, uh, this is funny to say as you know, because saying as you know doesn't necessarily mean anything. It just means I know. It doesn't mean we act that way, isn't it? Right? Isn't that funny? Well, as you know, you can't change the past. Yeah. And most of us are still trying to change the past. We don't, we don't like what happened in the past. I wish it didn't happen. Oh, why did it have to happen? Oh, if I could go back and change it. You know, I, you know, that person did that, you know. And so this, this need to control is so evident in trying to control the past. That, there was one writer, I, I don't know who she is, but I read one quote and she, she gave a definition of forgiveness and she said, forgiveness is to give up all hope for a better past. Kind of like a Buddhist, Buddhist. What did the Buddhist guru say? Give up all hope for a better past. So I think, I think you know, if you don't think you're a controller, you don't understand how you're trying to control, just look at the past. Are you regretting, lamenting about, wishing this didn't happen? That's all not accept, accepting the past and wishing it could have been different. We're trying to control the past. Or you get in an argument with someone who said in the past, but it's already gone and they don't do that anymore. Yeah, but you used to do it, <laughs> right? Yeah, but I don't do it. Yeah, but you did it. So we're, we allow ourselves, uh, we can't control the past. The past does an excellent job of controlling us, isn't it? Now, if we start to go down the list of things we can't control that we try to control, I think maybe one of the biggest things we try to control is other people. Yeah, you try to control them. You ever try to control another person? How did that go? <laughs> Everyone's laughing. That didn't go too well. 
Actually, it went really bad. It went, it went south very fast, right? I tried it and it didn't work. And has anyone ever tried to control you? How did you like that? Mm, not so good, right? That wasn't fun, right? Remember when you were a teenager and your parents tried to control you? How did that feel? Did they try to control you when you were a teenager? They didn't try to control me. I was out of control. They, my parents realized they couldn't control me, so they gave up on me. It was like, whatever they said, I was like, yeah, whatever. I'm a very independent person. They gave up on me. But you know what it's like when someone tries to control you. You shouldn't do that. You should do this. So in contemplating this idea of control, and studying it and teaching about it, I, I started coming to a conclusion that really, if you, if you boil down what spiritual life is in, in, in one sense, spiritual life is really, really like the essence of it is acceptance, of being able to accept how things are that you can't change and how people are that you can't change. And as soon as you come to acceptance, immediately that anxiety goes away, that anxiety that you couldn't control, that you actually created, it goes away. And I want to tell you a story. This is a very interesting story. You like stories. Everybody likes stories, right? It's time for a story. Hold on. Hold on. OK. I was going to give some sound effects, but I put my keyboard in this weird weird mode and now I don't know what I did maybe I can get it back maybe there's hope for me all right after class you would have got some sound effects so take the clocks back way back before most of you were born or all of you were born to 1970, maybe 71. For a lot of you, that's like, that's like prehistoric times, right? 1970. No, those are good times. The hippies, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. You were all there in your last life, you know. You just don't remember. If you like those bands, it probably means you were a hippie in your last life. Right? So, I was made a temple president. I'm American and I was made a temple president. And I was 20 years old and I had been, had been a devotee eight months. So how would you like to be a temple president at the age of 20 after being a brahmachari for eight months and then be transferred to take over a temple that's in another country that snows, and I never saw snow before. I'm from California, there's no snow. Well, not in Southern California, Los Angeles. And so I got to see snow with three heavy weight brahmacharis, rah, who like to fight and you know, don't like to be controlled and don't like temple presidents from America, from the US. Yeah. So it was really, really difficult. I mean, really difficult. Yeah, I could give you the whole class and tell you how difficult it was, but you would feel so bad for me, you'd be crying during the whole class. So I'll avoid you the details, but I was in anxiety like I never before in my life. I'd become a, join the Hare Krishnas and experience real anxiety like you've never experienced before. It was like, it was like, now I'm in charge of a temple, I'm 20 years old, you know, no, where are we gonna get money? How do we do this? And I was like always worried about how things would go. We never had any money. It was like, we, we didn't have heat in the temple we lived in. It was crazy, right? So there was some light on the horizon and be, not being a Canadian citizen, I had to get some kind of green card or whatever you call in your country, some temporary residency card so I could live there and do that service. That was during the Vietnam War. And I don't know if you know this, but now you're gonna learn something you may have never known. If you were an American during the Vietnam War, you could be drafted to go to that war. It was not a voluntary army. But 
if you were in Canada and they tried to draft you, you didn't have to go. Somehow the Can Canadian, if you could just get into Canada and live there, then when the US government drafted you, you wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. So what do you think was happening? All these young Americans were immigrating to Canada to avoid the war. So I went to my lawyer. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you. I was, I was so happy to find this out because I didn't want to get the immigration because I wanted to leave because I was in anxiety. I just wanted to get me out of here. I don't want to be temple president. I don't want to deal with these heavy duty brahmacharis. I hate snow. There's no money. This is a true story. Okay, I'll give you the details of a true story. The winters in Canada, you get snow, it's freezing. It's probably not as cold as where you are in Berlin, but it's cold. Cold is cold, you know, once it gets cold, it's like, who can tell how cold it is? It's just cold, isn't it? You can actually, you know, if it's zero or minus five or three, it's all cold, right? Isn't it? So we didn't have any money. And I went up there like in the summer and the winter is coming and we have no warm clothes. All we have is sneakers and, you know, sweaters, that's it. And then one day a devotee joins and he brings like two suitcases. I guess what's in the suitcase? Sweaters, hats, gloves, warm boots. That's how we lived. We were totally in Krishna's mercy. So, so it was a lot of anxiety for me because I didn't know month to month how we were going to manage. And I, when I went for the immigration to see the lawyer and he said, you're probably not going to get in. He's, no, he didn't even say probably. He said, you won't because so many people are trying to get in. You're not going to get in. And in my mind, I thought, fantastic. I don't want to get in. <laughs> I just want, to, I want them to say, go back to the United States. Then I can go back to the temple I came from, where there were like 30 de devotees, you know, 25 brahmacharis. It was like a big family, very enthusiastic. So I thought, okay, this is good. You know, I have to go through the process because Krishna brought me here and I, I don't want to just leave. So I'll go through the process. And so I went through the process, you know, what do you have to do? fill out the forms, go to the border. And, and I was thinking 100% or maybe 99.9% .9 I was thinking, he's gonna look at me and, and say, you're a loser, you're, you're not qualified, you don't have any money, you dropped out of university, you know, you can't do anything, we don't want you in the country. That's what I was thinking they were gonna say. And he was just gonna say, no, you have three days to leave the country. And I was gonna say, thank you so much. You're my best friend. I don't want to stay here. I want to leave. Right? So, so I went to the border. And you'll never guess what happened. They let me into Canada. They gave me the card and said, welcome to Canada. I was like, Krishna, Krishna, you changed me up. What did you do to me? But my point was, at that moment, it was like, it was like one of those moments like, hello, you're not the controller, <laughs> in case you didn't know. Just reminding you, you thought you're the controller. Guess what? You're not. <laughs> and, and the first thing I thought was, I guess Krishna wants me here because this was not supposed to happen. I was not supposed to get immigration into Canada. I had no qualification for it. And it was during the Vietnam War. So immediately when that happened, I accepted. I said, this is obvious Krishna wants me here. And as soon as I accept, you know what happened? Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Immediately as it became peaceful, right? So when we're, whenever we're agitated, Whenever we're upset, think about this. Isn't it a situation that we're, we want to control that we can't? Why do you always do that? Why do you always have to do that? Why do you always have to say, I can't control you. I'm upset with you. Oh, I'm in a rush. I get a red light, right? Isn't it like you only get like all the red lights when you're in a rush? You ever have that experience? When you have all the time of the day, you get all the green lights, but when you're in a rush, and especially when you're in a rush, you always get behind the guy who's, who's driving like 10 kilometers below the speed limit, isn't it? 
So sometimes when that happens, I think, Krishna, okay, you're there. I know. You're testing me, right? So we want to control things. And I, I think the biggest spiritual test we all go through is acceptance. Being able to accept what other people are like, situations we can't control. And I think even maybe more difficult than accepting the way others are like is accepting what we're like. Do you ever go to look in the mirror and go, oh my God, how come you're like this? Why can't you be like that? You know, I joke, I, there's a there's kind of joke like, you know, nobody likes their karma. They like, like, I want the karma, like, can I get the money karma of Bill Gates and, you know, and the, like uh, the music karma of so-and-so and the beauty karma of so -and -so. You know, like we like other people's karma, right? So if you look at yourself, do you find imperfection? Yes? Have you found any imperfection in yourself? Yes, right. I mean, unless you're like Donald Trump, then, you know, you think you're perfect. But most people are not like him, right? He said something so funny yesterday. It was like right out of a movie, like a comedy movie. It's like, okay, he thinks like he's perfect. All right. But most people don't, right? And when we see our imperfection, we're not happy with it, right? And so learning to accept our imperfection is really, really important because if you don't, you become discouraged. We're all works in progress. We're all getting better every day, right? You're going to be much better, hopefully. You'll be much better in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. So accepting our own imperfection is sometimes the most difficult thing to accept. Sometimes even more difficult than accepting another's imperfection. And sometimes when we don't accept another's imperfection, it's because of the imperfection in ourselves that we see in them, isn't it? And it reminds us of our own imperfection and we get frustrated, right? So I think that's, I think for me, that's one of the, the big realizations I've had in the last few years in teaching this topic, that if, if we're boiling down, cooking the milk into kheer, thick, we boil down spiritual life, most of it boils down to just be able to accept what I can't change, accept the reality. And of course, this coronavirus is a, is a challenge for many people to accept this reality and to adjust with it. And so, before we go to questions, I just want to cover this other side. Malini was asking, how do you maintain faith through all of this? And when faith, when we lose faith, it seems like our perception is, where is Krishna in all of this? Why is this happening? Why doesn't he do something about it? That kind of thing. Like, how can I believe in a Krishna or how I'm doubting, I'm doubting because I think he should do it another way. And, and I was thinking about expectations. You know, we all have expectations, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a great way to be let down is to have a lot of expectations because you're expecting things will go a certain way. And when they don't, even though they were never intended to go a certain way, but because you thought they should go that way, when they didn't, you get let down, even though they weren't supposed to go that way. You ever have that experience? You have this idea in your head. So I think we have a lot of expectations about Krishna also. Well, he, if I were God, I wouldn't do it like that, you know? Like we expect Krishna to be, <laughs> you ever think that way? If I were God, I would do it like this. <laughs> Why is Krishna doing it like that? If I were God, I wouldn't do it that way. Have you ever thought like that? Raise your hand if you have. <laughs> yes. Right? So sometimes we have expectations of Krishna to do things a certain way, and he doesn't. And we lose faith. But he was never meant to do it that way. And I was thinking this morning, you know, especially when we see things don't go well, that's when we, most people, that's when their faith is tested when things don't go well, either in the lives of others, the lives of the world in general, the people they know, or their own lives. 
because we expect, well, if there's God, things should be better, especially in the lives of devotees. And I think sometimes we misunderstand Krishna's protection, how he protects us. Because sometimes Krishna has to make things difficult for us, for us to move forward. And we're thinking, why did he make it difficult? You know, I, I served him and now he made it difficult. It's not fair. It's not fair. I want my money back. And that what Krishna is doing is it's actually, he's pushing us towards him, but we don't know, we don't realize it. And then we realize it maybe after the mess is over and things clear up and we realize, oh, Krishna was helping me, right? So that's one point. I think we all have experience of that, right? Why, Krishna, why are you doing this to me? And then we realize there's a reason. That's happened to me so many times that when anything bad happens to me, I always think there's a reason, something good, Krishna's doing this. The other point, which is interesting to think about, is we have these expectations. Maybe if I'm a devotee, everything should be like better, kind of like everything should be like an island in paradise or something. But that's a false expectation because Krishna never said that anywhere. When you become my devotee, then when you plant a tree in your backyard, it will grow money. And your wife will be younger, and you guys, your muscles will grow. Krishna didn't say that. He said, no, if you're in the material world, you're going to have to work. And you're not going to grow younger every day. It's not, you ended up in a place that has trouble. And even though you're a devotee, you have a body. And so bodies have trouble. You know, you, if you jump up, you'll come down. There's laws of nature. You're a devotee, still the laws apply to you. If you fall asleep while you're driving, you know, you're probably going to crash and so forth. So Krishna never said, when you become a devotee, you know, just get in the car and go to sleep and it'll just get there. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, so he, he never promised this paradise, but he promised that if you surrender to me, I will take care of you eternally. That ultimately your eternal life, salvation, relationship, it's there. And somehow or other, as I often say, and maybe you can confirm this, there are a lot of fat Hare Krishna devotees. Is that true? Yes? Yes. What does that mean? That means Krishna feeds his devotees. Otherwise, how did they get fat? So it's not like when you become a devotee, you don't have a place to live, you don't have clothes, you don't have food, you have too much food, that's the problem. Not in, it's not like we don't have enough, we have too much, right? So Krishna does take care of us, but we, have may, may, we may have expectations of how he should take care of us. We may have expectations of how it should be, and then we lose faith because it doesn't sync with our expectations. So I think that's important. And then, um, Malini, I was, I was reading, uh, Prabhupada was asked some questions about faith, how it develops. And he said two things, and I think one thing is really important. One thing he said was association. I think we know that, association. But the other thing Prabhupada said is if faith develops as you become pure, that as you advance, your faith increases. So if we're lack if our faith is waning that should be a red flag that, that maybe something else in my spiritual life needs some attention or needs some tuning because faith decreasing is a symptom of something weakening somewhere else in my spiritual life because as we become more pure faith increases the last thing i want to say is very interesting there's a verse in the bhagavad gita shadho mayo yam and what this means is that faith is a natural psychological condition for everybody. So it's not that you lose faith. It's just your faith goes into something else, right? Like you say an atheist has no faith in God, but he does have faith. He has faith that there is no God. Does that make sense? If you, have, if you don't believe in God, that's your faith. I... And you say it, I don't believe in God. So I have faith that God doesn't exist because faith is a constitutional, fundamental, essential, core aspect of consciousness, right? All of us have faith, even if it's faith in something, even if I don't have faith in something, that's faith in a negative form, right? So I don't have faith in God, that means I have faith there is no God. So 
it, it's, I think it's important to recognize when we lose faith, look at it like a scale. I'm losing faith, but that means I'm increasing faith in something else. It's not like I just lose faith in Christian. Let's say this hand is Krishna consciousness. This hand is material consciousness. I'm losing faith in Krishna consciousness. What's happening? This is actually going up, pushing this down. And when this goes up, it pushes the faith in the material world down, right? So it's not like, it's not like I just lost faith in Krishna and this faith stayed the same. No, it's, it's going up. I'm, I'm looking for shelter in some, if I look for shelter in something other than Krishna, then that's where my faith might lose my faith. Or if I'm losing my, it's, they just work together. Right, and as my faith in Krishna increases, my faith in the material world decreases. So, just to end, look at the material world. Where is the shelter here? Why should we have faith in this world when it can't give us shelter? Krishna is the only one can, who can give us shelter. So, no, I, it's not the last thing. It's the second to last. I have one last thing. But in spiritual life, it's unlimited. So you can have many last things. It's okay. Right? So I can have more than one last thing because spiritually it's unlimited last, right? Everything's unlimited. So I have one last thing and it may not be the last, but it could be. So when you put your faith in Krishna, he reciprocates. When you don't put your faith in Krishna, he doesn't reciprocate. So that's the problem. When we lose faith, it's like Krishna starts disappearing because He's got not, you lost your faith, so he's got nothing to reciprocate with. The more faith you have, the more he has to reciprocate with. And the, the more faith you have, the stronger it gets. The less faith you, faith you have, the weaker it gets. So it's important to know that's how it works. So I think I should stop, because that was a mouthful, and it's, and it's time for questions. I could go on, believe me. I could do a whole seminar on this. It's each, each topic that I touched on, you could just open up. But anyway, some seeds were planted. So do we have, would you like to ask some questions? Or you have some points you want to add for discussion, some realizations. You must have had some realization, right? Or you want to rate my jokes, which were the best three jokes? <laughs> Yeah. Hare Krishna, thank you for your lecture. And, You're welcome. Uh, my name is Gerda, and um, in the last year I really discovered that maybe this is the point. I want to get ready for death. I want to be, I don't want to be afraid, and this is a point you made. And um, I think, like in Krishna consciousness, I like hope to, to get to this point, but still, what is really. Um, yeah, difficult to me is how is Japa um, preparing me for this in the sense of like um, uh, um, seeing that this is not my body and I don't have to be afraid to, to, to let it go, let go. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe it's a stupid question. I'm sorry. No, it's not. Okay. Well, it's clear. It's clear. Actually, it's a good question because one time Prabhupada was explaining to the devotees, he said, well, how, how do you know you're making spiritual advancement? Because anything you're doing, you want, you want to have the advancement. I'm doing it correctly, and I'm getting better at it, right? Just like if I'm playing my keyboard, and then my teacher comes. I don't have a teacher, but if I have one, I show him. His, I have to show him, and he goes, oh, you're doing it all wrong. It should be done this way or you're doing it all right good so i know i'm progressing so Prabhupada gave a lecture and he said how do you know you're progressing spiritually he said you will know because you'll become more and more detached from the things of this world from sense gratification from the concept of i'm the enjoyer the controller the doer all of that and and that i can be happy with material things you'll become more and more detached from that and many sensual desires will start to to subside I don't want to say neutralize immediately, but they'll subside. And then you'll start to become more attached to being with devotees, to chanting, to reading, and so forth. Um, so I think we all have that experience to some degree, at least in the beginning, that's kind of evident. You know, One of, one of the famous mantras of people who are starting to become Krishna conscious is, oh, I don't want to go to work. I just want to stay at the temple all day. 
I hear that all the time. It's like, it's like, it's like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, I, I knew I was not like so happy and like that, but now I really realize how bad my life was <laughs> now that I'm in Krishna consciousness. So, so Prabhupada said, the symptom of spiritual practice will be detachment. One of the symptoms of detachment is going to be detachment from the body. But here's the good news. Detachment from the body doesn't always mean, uh, we, we shouldn't always think about it in like, I just, I don't want anything or I feel pain, it doesn't bother me. Or, you know, I could just die now, no problem. That, that may come at a more advanced stage. But part of it is your, your willingness to follow spiritual practices. Because if you follow spiritual practices, that also means you're not identifying with the physical body. For example, you, you get up early in the morning. If you identify with the physical body, you would sleep more. And then you get up and you chant. Well, if you identify with the body, you'd get up and go on Facebook or, or do something that would give you pleasure, right? Don't go on Facebook the first thing in the morning. That means you're addicted. That's the first thing you do. You're an addict. Take your phone and flush it down the toilet like you would drugs when you're giving up drugs. Yeah. No, you can send it your phone. Don't flush it. I need a new phone. My phone is cracked. Look at this poor phone. Cracked in 100 places. If you're an iPhone addict, just give me your phone. You'll, you'll be fine. Right? So what, what it means is that I may not realize I'm the body like self-realized. You know, I can take a bath in the winter in the, a, a cold lake and chant home. But at least I'm living a more spiritual life. And so you'll see that as you progress spiritually, you're going to become more interested in spiritual practices. You're going to become more able to give certain things up that are detrimental. And so that chanting is the most powerful way to make advancement. Therefore, that chanting is actually doing it. The problem is it happens so slowly because we're so conditioned, we don't notice it. The other problem is when you're cleaning, the dirt comes up and we start noticing the dirt and we think, actually, I'm getting worse. So we, we, all, we don't always calculate it. We're not always getting worse. We're, a lot of times we're getting better, but because we're better, we can see how bad we are. Whereas before, we didn't think we were bad. Does that make sense? Like, you know, it's like, I'm more pure now, so I could see how impure I was. And so it makes me feel more impure. <laughs> But I'm only, it's only because I'm pure that I could see that I was impure. So sometimes these things happen. So this imperceptible advancement, it's hard to see. But gradually, you can see in your own life, you're probably becoming more detached. You know, less interested, maybe not perfectly detached, but less interested in material things, more interested in spiritual things. So that's the sign. And that's what chanting is doing. And so, you know, when you begin chanting, it's, it's almost like for some people, the mantra is just like a sound. It's like, what's going on? Nothing's going on. But you do it every day over and over. And then you, you'll look at yourself and say, oh, I really changed. That's because I'm chanting. And then you'll, you'll if you enter this mood, like everything I talked about today, acceptance and not wanting to control and detachment, you can all chant praying for that. Krishna, allow me to accept myself, allow me to accept my partner, allow me to accept what's going on. Uh, I'll, I'll help me lose my need to control what I can't control. You can chant and pray for those things while you're chanting. So you can practically see the benefit. You'll be happy to know that I've created 25 guided meditations to prepare us to chant. One of them is on acceptance. One of it is on control. One of it is on forgiveness. So, you know, the three things we talked about, I have meditations that before you chant, one's on detachment, control, mind control, acceptance, forgiveness, detachment. Like, so you can pray for these things. So soon you will be able to hear those. So not yet. Stay tuned, but they're coming soon. And they're really, they're beautiful and they're powerful. So. You can use the holy name that way. Did that answer your question or you have something else? Okay. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. 
Hare Krishna, this is uh, Vidarbha here. If I may ask a question. Where are you? Uh, Vidarbha? Yes. Can we see your lotus face? Oh, <laughs> I'm, okay. Just like, give me a minute. Um, yes, Prabhu, um, I just had um, a couple of questions, uh, if I may ask. Uh, I'm just coming on live. Just give me a minute. I'm just changing my location. Okay. Yeah. Um, Where are you? I'm in Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, yes, yes, Prabhu. Um, so my okay, question we'll is... Have fun with Donald Trump a few minutes ago. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yes. Yes, well, so my question is that, you know, as you talk about acceptance um, and letting go, um, I find that uh, as I'm going through a, a particular situation right now and the acceptance is there at the level of the mind and the intelligence and, uh, and, I, and I want to, I'll completely accept and, and give up any sense of control. Um, it's in relationship to my son who's now an adult. And so I homeschooled him. And so I'm trying to let go of that, uh, you know, homeschooling by nature has a certain amount of control built into it. And so, so I'm going through that process. And as I, you know, in my intelligence and in my mind, I know that this is where I want to be, want to be, but at my heart level there, I'm still not there yet. So is it a process of grieving? So I, I almost feel that there is a process of grieving that I'm going through right now as I'm letting go. Um, is that grieving? Is, is it the grieving part? And of course, taking deeper shelter of Krishna, is that what will allow me to go from acceptance at a men mental and intellectual level to real acceptance at a heart level? where there is well, no longer any, any yeah, pain. It, 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 yeah, it, it, it may be, you have, because you have to face the emotions connected with the suffering. That's, that's mm -hmm. the process, which most people don't want to do. How old is he? He's 21 and he's oh. going to be 22. So he's in college now. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just my own realization that if I, don't, if I don't let go and if I don't come to a deeper place of acceptance, I'll really not be able to, serve him well and and, and you know the, the, when you say grieving you mean grieving for yourself for your own grieving for myself uh, grieving for the fact that i had a certain um expectation of certain outcome and he's um yeah, he's yeah. his life choices and um uh, it's it's painful you know, what, you know what the problem is Sri Darba? i yes, will bless you in your next life you'll be born an american mother you won't have the problem <laughs> <laughs> you know you're in america you know american yeah. Americans don't have that strong attachment. It's yes. like, it's like, you know, attachment for your son is so good to a certain point. And then it becomes toxic after a certain point. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yes. So I, I would, if I were you, what you say is true, but I would also apply it to anything in your life because it can't just be for your son. It has to be a tendency. You know, it's just, there's more, more of that attachment towards him, obviously. Yeah. But there may be, you know, just a tendency to extend attachment beyond what's healthy, right? There is a healthy level of attachment, and then, you know, you've gone beyond the threshold of that. And so that may be also part of your nature, too. Is that true? I don't know. To control? Uh, no, I think, um, I think for me, maybe because I've been preaching, um, maybe uh, there is a, um, there's a natural way in which, um, you know, and I guess I've, you know, I've been preaching for so many years and it's so many people have come and they've gone. And of course, you know, I, I have learned to accept people's yeah. life choices and whether they want to really practice this path or not. But when it comes to your own son, and especially when you have seen him, you know, exhibit such interest and then all of a sudden change on you, I think there is a lot more acceptance that, um, that is required. It's, it's um, I'll, I'll tell you something that could help you. We, we were reading yesterday in our class on death, um, Prabhupada talking about heart transplants. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Like what happens to the soul and does that increase a person's life? And Prabhupada said something amazing. He said, you are destined, you are destined by your karma to live a certain wow. amount of time. And that heart transplant, it may relieve some pain or suffering, but it does not increase your duration of life. Hmm. Prabhupada also said, you know, your happiness, your distress, you know. So I think we have to see that with our kids. It's like they have their karma, they have to learn, they have to go through what they have to go through. And you're not the only parent who's going through it, right? Yes. And every parent has to, you know, learn 
like it's kind of like I did my best. Okay, now let's go to the rest of the world. Look at Prabhupada. He had he had people who would do anything for him. They would kill themselves for him. They would do it. Of course, he never asked that. But we could say figuratively they would. Look at his own sons. Yeah. Prabhupada's own sons, they did nothing to help him spread Krishna consciousness. His own wife was just became an impediment. So I think, you know, Bhaktivinoda Thakur had, you know, sons who disagreed with him. And, you know, it's like, this is, you know, all I can say, Vidarva, this sounds unsympathetic, but it, it's, a, it's meant to be a philosophical statement. Of course, yes. Welcome, welcome to the material world. <laughs> yes. You know, please. like when bad things happen, that's like, um, when I say welcome to the material world, it, it's like, yeah, this is kind of normal yeah. for these things to happen. But I think for you, it will help you so much to just accept the fact that, like they say, you know the saying, 90% of what you worry about, you can't change. Yeah. And the 10%, you can't. So don't worry about the 10 because you can, and don't worry about the 90 because you can't. So whatever you can actually do for him, that you should do. And aside from that, you know. Yes, and that's exactly where. Do you I know about the Amish? This is, yes. Go ahead. You know what the Amish people do when their kids are teenagers? They say, "Go out, do whatever, right. whatever you want. Just go out and experience it, and then decide." Mm. And so you know, it's natural for some young person raised in Krishna consciousness. They want to go out and decide. With our daughter, we kind of did both, you know, because we didn't want to starve her. And then when she's like 20, you go, I never did this, you know. So I think, I think, I think maybe more needs to get in the head also. More of that information will help you, you know, and like, what can you actually control right now? Just, you know, write down on a piece of paper what you can actually control, what you could actually do to help him. That he, and then all the things you're trying to do that that have no effect and just look at it and that might help you just go okay all right you know because sometimes when you write it makes it you see it visually and you go oh i'm trying to do all this this is ridiculous it's just making our relationship worse yes. and and you know he has to learn and he'll learn in his own way in his own time i had a god brother i had a god brother who was a guru very powerful very successful and he ended up leaving um, in the course of leaving, he had, I, I think he went through two girlfriends at least and a few relationships in between. And I was talking to a God brother and um, I said, you, you ever, you ever, you think he's going to actually come back in this life and take up where he left off? And he said, no, he's got a lot to learn. He'll have to go through more. So sometimes you know, we have to see it that way. Our kids will have to learn yeah. Yeah. by experience. Yeah. And I do understand that. And I think that's what, for me as a mother, I want to reclaim myself because there is a momentum of care and concern and, 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 and trying to organize his life and stuff like that. And it's like, a, it's like, a, it's, it's like there's a slowing down or rather stopping of that. And, um, yeah. and transitioning. it's also a transition. Period. Yes, it is transitional. So I'm, as I'm experiencing this grief, I'm hoping that this grief will take, because I'm also praying and I'm, you know, really taking, trying to take deeper shelter. So I'm hoping I'll, I can see the exit door. <laughs> and, yeah, it, it's the beginning. Yes. It's, it's the beginning of the exit door, but not the only, not the only part of it. Um, mm -hmm. You have to, um, you have to now have a plan. Mm -hmm. You're facing it emotionally. Now you're going to have to have a plan practically. How am I going to? How am I going to actually succeed in making this transition into my new life? It's obviously different, you know. It's, life is not easy. No. no. You know, I was thinking we'd do a play, you know, and we're there with Krishna and we say, hey, I want to go in the material world. And Krishna's saying, nah, you don't really want to go there. It's not easy there. No, no, I just want to check it out, you know. I'm all, I'm in lockdown here in the spiritual world, you know. You're God and I'm not. And like, you know. And Krishna's saying, no, 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 no. You're not going to have a good time there. You're going to have to work and, you know, your son's going to like, 
who knows what he's going to become and you know, who knows what your husband's going to be like and what the government's going to no no i just want to try it yeah. and so you know i think it's nice to think that way and say well you know you know it's like this is what's going on so and so cheated me yeah well it doesn't happen up there it happens down here and you wanted to come down here so it's like it's like going to jail and sometimes they have fights in jail well you know if you weren't in jail you wouldn't have been in the fight <laughs> it's always it's always good to reflect on our existential condition as self-created ultimately even though he's got his independence but you know it's like okay here i am and this is this is what goes on here so i you know i have to learn to deal with this while i'm here but the beautiful thing is krishna helps us deal with it and it's just i really see your situation as a you know it's a detachment I'm holding on. on to this. Once you let it go, you're going to be like so, going to be so good and happy and powerful and mm -hmm. be able to help so many other people. And you can adopt so many other sons and give them Krishna. Prabhu, right? can you please take away that blessing? Because it's a blessing I don't want to come back again, least of all in America. <laughs> You'll take birth as a American woman in the spiritual world. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, we have this joke. We have this joke. Once, once Prabhupada said, there's going to be another ISKCON in the spiritual world. Oh, no, I don't want to go. Ah! <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> okay, that's just a joke. <laughs> this kind in the spiritual world will be a lot better than in the material world. As everything in the material in the spiritual world will be better. So don't worry. I just have to let you know I love your lectures, Prabhu. I follow you on Facebook and uh, I'm very Thank grateful you. for your, your insight. You. Okay. I also bless you with detachment. Uh, today, Vidarva is going to just face the reality. You're facing the reality emotionally, but you need to face it more intellectually, practic more practically. And you know, you write it out, and then it's just you look at the paper and you go, "Yeah, I I have no control anyway. So why should I think I'm controlling what I? You know, we're always thinking we're controlling. It's like this example. I think Reed Dianamarsh gave this example. In your country, do you have these amusement parks where you have cars for kids, and they have steering wheels, but the steering wheels don't do anything. They just with the cars on the track. So the kid gets in there and he's turning the steering wheel. Yeah? He's not doing anything, but he thinks he's controlling it, right? So that's false ego. You're, you know, driving your life and you think, I'm in control of my son and this and that, and, you know, turning this, and the wheel's just spinning around. It's not connected to anything. So false ego means <laughs> we're turning a spinning wheel. But it's not connected to anything. You're not controlling anything. Isn't that funny? That is Krishna. Yeah, so you realize you're just spinning a wheel that's not controlling anything, so, uh, you know, no need. Anyone else have a question, comment, objection, argument? Thank you, Prabhu. I think this was a very nice uh, point to end with. We would like to give everybody the opportunity to take darshan of Lord Jagannath in Berlin. So I will okay, perfect. turn the computer around. And um, thank you again so much for joining. I hope we can invite you again. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, once we are allowed to travel again, you will come and bless us with your presence personally. I'd love to. <laughs> so, Hare I'm having a good time not traveling, though, I have to admit. Okay, we're going to get to take Darshan, Jagannath. Jai Jagannath. Shabadaya Krishna Gustaya Bhutana. Namani Namaste Shari Shanti Devi Varavani Vachana. Jagannath Swami Ki Jai. Jai. Srila Prabhupada. Hari Haribo. Haribo. Thank you. Haribo. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next time. Hare Krishna. Be happy with Krishna. Haribo.